Trademark. I'm Dave. And I'm Sean. We are Barstools. And Band Talk. And before we introduce our next guest tonight, we're kind of getting a little back to the roots of how this thing all started with, um, you know, zooming, zooming people in. Um, you know, the one thing when we started the show, uh, April 28th, was uh, we wanted it to be a fun place for people. And that's what we want to have to continue. We wanted to, uh, you know, I know people are worried and people are anxious, but at the end of the day, this, this, is, this is a fun place where people can come, see some funny stuff, uh, and just, you know what, feel good about themselves and not have to worry about some of that stuff. So hopefully we're going to do that, and hopefully you guys will continue to keep tuning in. That's right. We, we're here to, to uh, maybe shine a little bit of levity, a little bit of humor, a little bit of information, just a little distraction from all the bullshit that is encapsulated 2020. So there's no one better than next guest we're going to have here that's going to help us forget about some of the crap that's going on in our lives. Because quite honestly, if you've watched the Liberty DeVito interview, and I know you did, if you watched the Hire a Gun movie, and I'm sure you should, if you haven't already, this gentleman would be no stranger. Why don't you bring him on, Sean? Yeah, so we've, we've been working on this for a while, and um, it's, uh, it's an honor to have this fellow on. I tell you, any time that you turn on the radio or just, you know, every time I hear the tunes that he played on, uh, they're happy and they're, they're upbeat and they're peppy. So we're, we're really glad to have Mr. The one and only Mr. Russell Javers, Russell Javers on the show with us. And we're going to be really excited to do this interview. There he is. Hello. You're a little sideways, brother. Am I? Uh, how do we do this? Okay. There, there you go. go. That doesn't work. There you okay. go. Perfect. There you are. Yeah, you're bang on. Okay. So we just want to say thanks. Thanks so much for doing this. Uh, we had Lib on a few months ago, and he was a hoot. And just in the couple minutes we were talking, um, I said I said to Dave a couple of times, I would have loved to jump into a time machine and hang out with you guys back in the day because you just always seem like such chill, cool dudes, man. You, you guys have that vibe where you just you're loving life no. and having a great time. We always had a lot of fun. We still have a lot of fun. The funny thing is, we're all we're all playing together, and it's, it's so we have a band now that uh, it's me. Richie Kanata and Lib, and up until the virus, we were touring, and it was going great, and it was just like stepping back. You know, it was like nothing changed. It was the same shenanigans, all the nonsense, and uh, just having a lot of fun. This is the Lords of Fifty Second Street, right? Uh huh. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about that. You know, you get you three guys, and and um, mm -hmm. do you have any anybody else that's in the band that's kind of accompanying you? Oh yeah, we have. Um, we, the 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 lineup has shifted. The focus is essentially, you know, we're not a tribute band, but those are. Lip had the funniest line. He said, "If if Billy's the father of those old songs, we're at least the uncles." Yeah, yeah. Because we, you know, because we arrange them. So it's we play. The, the you know the records that we were on, but you know we do them in the original keys. We, uh, you know, we're all geezers, but we bring a lot of energy to it. You know, so it's uh, a lot of people that see it said, wow, it's just like I step back in time. You know, it's like, uh, so it's a lot of fun. And it's, uh, it's a, and we have a great kick-ass band. A couple of the guys in our band were musical directors for Road Troops of Billy's Broadway show. Nice. And they're all great players. And we, uh always have a great guy. We had this one guy um, that, that was the, the, the singer keyboard player who's amazing. And now, and we have a couple others too. So, um, and this virus really screwed everything up. So, uh, you know, we're, there'll be a couple of lineup changes, but the, the focus is pretty much on, on the three of us and, and the fact that we got an unbelievable bunch of guys playing with us. Right on. And it, I, I, I want to say that when people actually watch this, and I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. I was at a, it was a, a customer appreciation uh, thing a few years ago. And um, there was a band and they started doing some of the old Billy Joel tunes. And I swear to God, from the, the grandmother that was 80 to the, the girl that was 23, they knew all the words. They were like, it was just a feel good sort of thing. It must be pretty cool to know that you were a part of that. And, and really, um, it, it you know, really is. That. But you want to laugh? This this thing got together by accident because uh, my last year with Billy was 80, 80, 89, something like that. It was after the Russian tour, 
And, you know, so I was there from 75, from turnstiles, pretty much, you know, through, you know, late 80s. Um, and after the band broke up and after Doug passed away, I, I, I just kind of felt, you know, lightning, you know, you don't catch lightning in a bottle more than once. And I had right. other interests and I kind of reinvented myself and I wound up living overseas and I got a call from who the guy who's now our manager and he was going to put us in the um, Long Island Music Hall of Fame. I hadn't right. seen these guys. I hadn't played an electric guitar in 10 years. Well, I still right. had my, I was living overseas. I, um, so I always played acoustic guitar, but it was more intimate and stuff. So I, you know, I didn't have an amp. I didn't, you know, it was like crazy. Um, and I said, I don't know, nobody gives a shit about us anymore. I don't care. I, you know, I don't want to do it. And they were going to also, in, in part of our band, they were going to uh, induct Doug Stegmeier, mm -hmm. who was my best friend. He was right. best man at my wedding. And, and, and we were brothers. Player. And and Doug's mom says, you know, I really wish you would be there. I said, I'm done. I'm there. You know, so. But what I found out was we were supposed to do one song at the end of this night. And there was a lot of people that got inducted that night from Ron Delsner, the promoter, the big promoter in New York, to Jerry Goffin, to Curtis Blow, to there was a bunch of people on the, um, you know, on the list with us and we were the last ones and I thought uh, you know maybe we should we rehearsed we hadn't seen each other in a million years so we rehearsed you know for an hour or two to do like one song which was what we we're supposed to do we say yeah, maybe we better do another one it's 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 Long Island they, they might want us to do another one that's right wound up they had us do like five or six songs they wouldn't let us off the stage we had a full page and Newsday and Delsner the big promoter says you got to take this on the road but I never realized that people really cared about us and that we would like the soundtrack to a lot of people's lives. You know, oh my God, like, Russell. You know, I never much. think about it, but getting an opportunity to go out and do this stuff again, I realized there's such a, you know, first of all, there's a catalog of amazing songs and, and we're all really proud of, you know, what we contributed to those, but they're Billy songs. And, uh, the fact that people cared just blew my mind, you know? So, and, and so taking that out on the road with the Lords, it, it wouldn't have happened if it weren't for our manager, Andy, really pushing us all to do this thing. And then uh, the, the name, the Lords was a name that our producer, Phil Ramon gave us. He says, you know, everybody, he goes, everybody knows the E Street Band and you guys are, are so important. You sell 10 times more records than Bruce, you know, um, you got to call yourself something. So, uh, so Phil made up these jackets. In fact, hold on, I'll show you something. Cool. It's, I don't have the, uh, the original jacket anymore. I don't know what the hell I did with it, but, um, Phil made up these jackets like the, from the Lords of Flat, Flatbush and they were really ugly. They had, they were like black jackets with yellow leather sleeves and stuff and they had their names on it and with this logo uh -huh. the oh, that's cool victory. now i'm doing a project right now with um for phil ramon which i'll tell you about in a bit and and his brother-in-law is the head of this thing that we're doing and sent me this because i couldn't find mine he said oh you might want this and then what we did for the lords is um i had a friend of mine uh, a uh an artist who kind of modernized it a little, made it more like a biker logo. Well, it looks but, like a biker um, logo. That's exactly what I was thinking when I saw it. Yeah, yeah, but the, our, our logo now is really, you know, it's, it, it's very cool. Wait, let me put this back. So anyway, so it was amazing. So we just got back together and we had like one rehearsal and we went out on the road and the response was like so incredible that, um, and, and, and it's really crazy because we were getting all these, gigs and it was like every year it kind of picked up and picked up um we had a when we originally started you know we figured out let's just try this out see if there's any interest and then Richie got sick Richie we almost lost him he, oh, he wow. got lymphoma and it was a nightmare and it took him about a year to be cancer free and and now and, and, and he still has to go to therapy and do stuff but he is playing better than he ever played and it's like it's so it's that's amazing and uh and liberty is liberty 
Yeah. And, and you know, and I'm the salt and the subtle. I just get in there and, <laughs> and do my thing. Did it come so, right back though, Russell? Did it like you guys are on stage? Like I said, you know each other since you're 15. Again, I yeah. thought you were 29. I could be wrong. Yeah, but right. I mean, a lot of years together. Did it come right back to you? Um, the feeling came right back. But for me, um, the acoustic <clears throat> stuff was easy. But the you know, I can't read music. I'm self-taught, and, and and Lib and I always played in bands since we were kids, so we have that communication. But for me to get my chops back right away when the gig started, it took me a little while to to really feel like I was me again, you know. So, like I said, I I, I had kind of reinvented my life for a while. Uh, I was living overseas for a million years. I was, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I have a lot of interest and I was pursuing all of those things. And, and, and frankly, it was a lot of fun. I'm, you know, I, I've been very blessed that I have a bunch of interesting experiences that, uh, that I get, got to uh, experience, so. So when we talked to Lib, and I mean, anybody that's, I guess, a hardcore die diehard Billy Joel fan would know your guys' story, but a lot of people, I mean, don't don't know the fact that you guys were a band beforehand. And, oh yeah. Um, so so to tell us a little bit about that, because I read Lib's book. I mean, it's his book's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because I'm reading the book and I can hear his deep voice as I'm reading, <laughs> reading the words. It's amazing. But just talk about that a little bit. Um, well. Eh, I I used to go to this club. Uh, I grew up in a town called Plainview on Long Island. And in that town, there was a little club and they didn't sell alcohol. So they had these daytime shows, but everybody would come through. We'd see the Rascals there, Sam and Dave. It was great. And there were a couple of bands that were the house bands. They were like, you know, and, and there was a band called the Hassles and Billy was the keyboard player in the Hassles. Uh, although he replaced a friend of mine who was much older than me, but, you know, but, um, and he was Billy's first wife's brother. <laughs> and John Small was the drummer who, who later produced all of our videos and, and, and got every video out of Nashville. And um, so Billy replaced Harry. Um, and then Lib was in another band called the New Rock Workshop. And I used to go there like every day. We even played there a couple of times when I was a baby back then. Um, <laughs> and, you know, Lib's a couple of years older than me, but, um, but, I, but I was just like a baby, you know, but, but thrilled. And so, I, and I would see these guys playing and they were my idols. And, and I said, I'm gonna be in a band with that guy. But it, was, it wasn't Billy, it was Lib. I said, oh my God, you know, that's the guy that, cause I started off writing songs and, never thought of myself as a guitar player, but it was more, I had so many friends that were great players and stuff, and they would help me frame these songs. So that's how the band started, is I had these songs that I wanted to get down. And I started with Lib, I gotta be in a band with this guy. And I just pestered him really until, you know, I broke <laughs> him down. And I would just show up at his house all the time. And, uh, and then uh, a keyboard player friend of mine uh, introduced me to Doug. And then the three of us got together. And then another guy that I grew up with that I, I played with a guitar player named Howard Emerson, who's amazing. And Howard um, did that Turnstiles album with us in that first tour. And then he left. And he still, he just has another album coming out now. You got to check him out. He's really, really good. Um, but that, that was the nucleus of it. And, and honestly, it was pretty, when we played bars, they would say we were the worst band that ever played because those were the top 40 days and we'd do all original stuff and stuff that interested us, but we didn't give a shit if the crowd liked it. We never thought we were going to, we never thought we were going to retire playing in bars uh, on Long Island. So we did original stuff. And then Doug's brother, uh, was an engineer in the studio and he would like sneak us in and we'd get all this free time and we really learned how to record together and what happened is we had this chemistry that started to happen and so it was kind of cool when we got to Billy we were all so friendly and we were all so used to framing a song as opposed to showing off right that that really was a big benefit it was our attitude and then Phil Ramone loved us um because that was always the attitude that we brought in. Um, and uh, so, so that was kind of the transition. But the funny, so the funny thing is though, it's, 
you know, we had another guitar player after the first album, David Brown, who was amazing. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I do what I do, but, but I'm, you know, I'm not like, you know, like, like Richie or, you know, Lib, but I bring another element into it that's kind of interesting. It's more primitive. It's more from my idols were John Lennon and Keith Richards. And I always try to find that basic element. You know, I, I always hated when bands sounded like uh, LA studio musicians. Mm -hmm. I love the I love the Motown guys who were amazing, and that was his own thing. But when I'd hear a band that that sounded like a bunch of LA studio guys, and every band, the same band, and every band sounded like, hated it. And uh, you know, so I I always liked the little rough edge. I was a huge reggae fan, so I always had that little staccato reggae kind of pulse underneath. Yeah, and yeah. Me and Doug used to breathe together when we played, so that would kind of always find its way onto the records. So, what happened so, to those first songs, Russell? The songs that you wrote. You know, it's so funny that you said that because because I had a like uh, Karen Carpenter did a couple of my songs. Yeah. Um, I just found I'm cleaning up, and I just built a little studio in my house here because of COVID. I got no place to go, and I'm still learning how to use it. And and the album that we did, it's in Liberty's book actually, is that I didn't play on the Stranger album because I was doing my own record and I had a full orchestra that I hired and, and, and whatever. And I was like kind of an egomaniac in those days. And I, and I wanted to produce it and I wanted to do everything. God knows I wish I had a producer, but the, so we only really finished one song. Those were the topper tapes. That was the name of our band. I only had like one song that got finished that I was happy with. And uh, Rob Mounsey, if you know who that is, um, Rob plays with Steely Dan and, and, and amazing, amazing, amazing player. But that was one of his first gigs and he, we hired a full orchestra and he charted it and did the whole bit. It was like crazy. But so, so that song wound up with Karen Carpenter. Phoebe Snow did one of my songs. Um, uh, another one Karen did. So it, it said nothing ever happened because the engineer, it was the same studio that we did turnstiles at and the engineer was the same guy that did turnstiles and he got divorced and he was storing the masters and his wife destroyed all the masters. Oh. And so there's nothing left. So I got this thing and I figured, you know what, maybe that's why it never came out. This stuff I have a horrible cassette mixes. They're not even mixed. They don't all have the right lyrics and stuff. So I don't really have a copy of it. So I never did anything with it. And now just for posterity, uh, I'm going to just, probably lay some stuff down once I learn how to use all this shit. So. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you covered a lot of racetrack there because you, you, you talked about how you don't read, no. uh, but then you, you had somebody come in and do an orchestra score on, on a couple of your tunes. Right. So when you were playing back then, did you ever run into the, we'll call them the, the learned musicians that kind of like, they met you thinking that you were this, you know, guy that played in this huge band, and then they kind of maybe looked down their nose at you a little bit because you weren't. Yeah, you know what? The... We did. It's my. Yeah, we did a show, in. Uh, well, Luke can't read either, you know. So it's like you know, you know. So it's like I, and I'm not so sure Billy can read either. Like I say, what the hell is that chord? He goes, I don't know. There's a G in it, and there's a D in it, and it's like, <laughs> you know. But <laughs> you're here, but, um, you're here, <laughs> but. But Billy, it's one thing because I can write and arrange and I hear it in my head and, you know, but my scribble as to how to chart the stuff out is I'm a little dyslexic. So when I see the dots and the stuff on, I can't read a map and I can't, you know, that stuff drives me crazy. So I have my own, you know, um, tablature that would get me through. Um, but uh, but yeah, but I hear it and it's it's mechanical. I, I I hear all the parts. I can arrange it. I you know I, I dream at night and, and I go crazy. So it's not, I, when you say you can't read, I just can't read the notes. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's just a big jumble. I hate yeah. to admit this. I shouldn't even be saying this, but but it's true. Um, but uh, I on one of the Karen Carpenter sessions, um, we played I, I had written this song it was a very simple song and it was me Lib, doug and dave and bob james on keyboards you, you know great jazz player and phil goes with well, I, I didn't have a chart i didn't have anything they had a tape that karen heard so um 
so Bob James had a chart. He goes, Jesus, I know, you know, I haven't done this, you know, since I'm a kid. So, but he's, I'm sitting there and I'm playing it and he's trying and he says, well, that, you know, this sounds so simple, but it's interesting. You do this crazy stuff where everything tugs at each other thing. So he kind of got it. And it was a good thing. We had that opportunity to sit together to work it out because he could see where my mindset it's kind of primitive it's like a you know from the outside so it was uh you know just an, another day in the life you know but that technology is available now russell you can you can write a song you can play along with it in the in the goddamn computer we'll chart it out for you oh yeah yeah yeah. but in those days this is the 70s no. you know or whatever the 80s but in those days no but yeah 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 and i never worried about that i i i, I write it and arrange it and then you make a tape and you copyright it and you're done <laughs> you know publish your rights are intact there you go there you go baby <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I've, I've always been fascinated by back in, in those days how albums were recorded um hmm. and because you know they still stand up they still sound amazing uh but obviously the technology was a lot different um what what would what would it be like when you guys were going to go into the studio to record? Um, well, we had probably the greatest engineer in the, in the world who became one of the greatest producers in the world. So we would go in and what was interesting is that Phil would hear the record in his head. So when we'd have the headphones on, all the effects that were going to be on the record, Phil already had in his head. So we'd hear it back like it was a finished record while we were recording it. And so that was pretty cool. And I mean, he was just such a, 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 a wonderful guy as a person and as a producer. And, uh, you know, so I, I really feel like I was so blessed to be around not only my friends, but they were also talented and, and everybody kind of uh, fed off of each other. And then Billy was amazingly talented. And Phil was just not only so talented, but just such a great mentor and a great person. Um, so those sessions were always fun. Um, and even when we struggled a little, we always had a lot of laughs. I mean, here's like a crazy story. So me and Lib had houses around the corner from each other and we would take the train into the city to do our sessions. So the train schedule was that we could either get there a half hour early or 15 minutes late. So obviously <laughs> we, we opted for 15 minutes late. And, um, but while we were on the train, we would write late notes from our wives. We'd make up these, you know, in two pieces. <laughs> so, yeah, and then we, you know, so, so like one was, and we lived around the corner from each other. So, so, you know, Lib would write the note, but as if it was from his wife. And dear Phil, please excuse Lib for being late, but uh, he was getting ready to go, and he had the window open in our bedroom. He was watching Family Feud, or what? You know, it's some you know, bullshit. And then, um, and and all of a sudden, it looked very overcast, and he got up to close the window, and a bolt of lightning hit the side of the house, knocking his glasses off of his head. And we had to go to the optometrist to get a new pair of glasses. So please excuse Lib for being late. So Lib would go in with the note and they'd read the note and I'm waiting outside. And then I'd come in five minutes later with a note from my wife that said, uh, dear Phil, please excuse Russell for being late, but he was just knocked unconscious by a pair of flying glasses. So, <laughs> you know, so every, so every day on the way into the city, we, we'd be sitting on the train laughing. So, we were at a party at Phil's house one day and Phil did everything. He, he's a guy that recorded Marilyn Monroe singing to Kennedy in the dressing. There's a picture of her in that dress. So he's got all these pictures of him with presidents and all these people. And next to that, he had this big frame thing of a couple of our late notes oh, <laughs> cool. framed it on the wall <laughs> next to Lady Bird Johnson. So... <laughs> What about but I mean, that, so cool. go ahead. Yeah, you know, I was gonna say that's fun because I mean, I've I've heard I've read stories of certain producers back that would just send musicians screaming because they were so particular, or strict, or or uptight or whatever, and that just sounds like such a fun atmosphere to go in. Well, and yeah, but it. but remember, it was Phil. So a, you had to earn your way into the room, mm -hmm. and you had to know the rules. And let me tell you, he wouldn't hesitate to be on your ass. But the philosophy was like i think all the people that worked for him and the engineers and stuff were terrorized of him yeah 
because he was very demanding and he's the guy that wrote the book, you know, for engineering and stuff. So, but the whole idea was to make us comfortable, to make us, you know, to, to not lose that creativity in the room. And he was a nurturer and stuff and he believed it and he lived it and he gave us that atmosphere to be creative. And you, you just didn't, you, there was always a respect there that, you know, you were thrilled that he respected you enough to have you in the room because he worked with everybody. And, um, and then you knew that if you didn't have anything to say or play, keep your mouth shut and don't, mm. and don't take the air out of the room. And, you know, so it, it was, a, it, there was pressure, but it was, it was all good pressure. I guess my and, question. Oh, go ahead. No, no because and, and nobody finish. was there to show off. Everybody was there to, you know, I think what he loved about us is that we were all there to frame these songs, not to show off. But, it, it, and I learned these stories being with the Lords now, like Richie told us they did a song called Stiletto. And there's like a, and I didn't play in that one because I, you know, that's when I was doing the topper stuff, which, oh, just to take a back step, I learned how that thing went down because I didn't do, I did the Stranger tour, but I didn't play on the Stranger. And they had told, you know, Phil came on and he's going to be the producer. And they, and, and he set a date for the recording. And this is the first I ever heard of this reading Lib's book. And they said, well, we can't do that date. We have a session with Russell that day. And Phil was cool with it. But Billy goes, no, you're my band now. And it's like, oh, my uh, God. So, but Billy actually played on, on a couple of things on, on my stuff in those days, too. So, you know. And then I went and did, I, you know, I did the Stranger Tour. And then realized that <laughs> my record deal was dead and, and stayed with Billy. But um, so... But see, you were there, I guess, Russell, and I said the same thing to Lib, too. I mean, and Sean and I are just sometimes just shake our head and we look at it. It's like, you wrote, performed, and toured with the single most, you know, important artist of the 70s and 80s, really, in a lot of ways. 60s, well, 70s, 80s, for sure. And at the largest venues and stadiums in the world. Like, yeah. I guess my question is, like, what was your takeaway from the whole thing? What was your favorite moment? Was it, like, the Russia tour? Or? That was the Russia tour was the most interesting. <laughs> Um, without a doubt, but you, you know something, I, we used to play the garden too. And so part of it that I hated because everybody would bitch about getting us tickets and you know, we lay out the money and we, we paid for the tickets, but you know, <laughs> so you had to, you, you know, and it would be like, you know, like $20,000 worth of tickets and the, and, you know, and, and it would, you feel bad going, hey, you know, excuse me, but you know, how about hit me back for the tickets? But my poor wife would be, you know, have to do it. And, you know, how many front row seats are there? If everybody's getting all these tickets from the van, you know, so it's like everybody would bitch about their seats. So that was the part of playing at the garden that I hated. But when you played at the garden, the energy, and it's the garden, and it's like, oh my God. And they, we played, you know, the garden one night and Paul Simon was playing downstairs in the small room, uh, the Felt Farm, I think it was called back then. And, and we had the crowd going, you could feel the, the place shaking. And Paul said that his lighting trusses were swaying when we had the crowd going that we fucked up a show. And uh, <laughs> so, but uh, so, so those were like, you know, always good and I would stand there and I always felt like I'm a big baseball nut and I you know so I always felt playing with Billy was like playing for the Yankees like you know you had all these you know all these all-stars around you and then you'd go in there and sometimes you're just standing there and, and you're in the moment and everything and you'd see how this guy could take an arena like that and turn it into a living room and the people were just so responsive and so um so into it and stuff and there was so there was so much energy flowing from the stage and then back at us and you'd stand there sometimes and go wow this is like a dream this is like so i felt like i was in a world series with the yankees when i would mm. do that on a good night you know and it was like so you know i, I there's certain moments that i remember just getting that feeling going wow this is pretty good well i absolutely love what you're saying too about how uh, uh, what i'm getting is musical over you know crazy chops and you know set up the song and make sure it's the song first um because 
not a lot of people when they learn how to play necessarily think like that. They want to show how good they are every second of it, you know, and there's something to be said for a well-written song that has all the parts exactly where they need mm. to be. Right. Yeah. But, but that said, there's some crazy, yeah. I mean, like David would play some amazing stuff and it would be the yeah. first thing I, you know, that's not me. I, you know, I, I was blessed that nobody was competing with each other. So we all found our slot and we all found our way to, you know, to be ourselves yet contribute to this, you know, so it's like, um, you know, once again, I, I was just really lucky to be surrounded by the people and, and, you know, and I'm sure my perspective, you know, added something to them too. So, but, but yeah, it's not like those records didn't have chops on them. It's just, mm. they probably weren't chops from me. That's all. Well, you know, it's a good point because when, when Lib was on, I mean, one of my one of my favorite tunes that he played on was Moving Out. And he actually explained it to me. I'm a drummer. So he explained yeah. it to me how he's playing eighth notes as opposed to what you think would be sixteenths on a yeah. hi-hat. And I'm like, whoa, not only did I not figure it out right, but it's pretty hard to play when you do it like that. It's got a whole different groove onto itself that's so so cool. Did he tell you how that bump, bump, ba da da, how that lick came? He did Billy, not. Always used to, Billy always used to, he used to smoke in those days and some people probably still does. But um, he used to always clear his throat <clears throat> like that. Always he would clear his throat, and then <clears throat> bum, bum, ba, da, da. <laughs> so that became Billy cleared his throat. Just <laughs> let... He transposed his <laughs> throat in garbage. <laughs> That's awesome. Isn't that good? <laughs> well, what about some of your favorite moments, like writing? Because I mean, you can't. I mean, this is the thing that breaks my heart a little bit now. So we talked a little bit about it too, because to watch the early videos, to watch you guys in pictures and performances. And again, I'm a little old school too. You think you're a band, you're a unit, but it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's a hired gun. You're a guy, you're this, you're a side band, you're whatever, which is a drag to me. I don't know about that. You know, we always thought we were a band. Bill even thought yeah. we were a band. Yeah. So we never felt like hired guns. You know, we felt like, uh, we felt like we were a band. Um, we acted like it. We felt like it, you know, so, you know, uh, I never thought of myself as a session guy, whereas Lib can do sessions. Richie's a great session guy. You know, uh, I'm kind of like an oddball of my own, um, you know, I'm me, you know, but, um, but we always felt like a band and we, and th that's why the Lords is a band, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, you know, it, 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 it's, you know, Lips played with a million people and a million great bands. He's got another band called the Slim Kings that, that are great. And, um, but we had our own little space in that point of time that, you know, and we're lucky that that stuff stuck around and, and, and still resonates a little bit. So. Well, and, and what's and, interesting to me, Russell, is uh, you guys – you know, we talked to Lib, and I mean, I saw the movie Hired Gun, and I remember saying to anybody that would listen, if I get to spend five minutes talking to that man, I could die. And it, it, he was as advertised, absolutely fantastic. And he's, you know, he's a character. Oh. As there you go, my friend. As I got are, into yeah. that. I was in that movie by accident. Um, the direct Lib said, you know, I guess they were trying to get some perspective on some of the things that Lib said. And Lib said, well, call Russell. You know, he was there. So I'm on the phone with the director and the movie was already edited pretty much um and i'm on the phone he goes that's it i'm sitting in a film crew and so my stuff kind of got it edited in later and he even used the he bits of a couple of topper songs in there it's the background when mm -hmm. lips talking those are two topper demos but um but uh i said well who else is in the movie so he goes well kenny aronoff and he goes jay grade and i said whoa wait a minute jay grade and i said what does he talk about and he said he talks about the solo for peg i said well guess what i was sitting less than five feet away from him when he played that solo because i was at that session and he goes well we'll talk about it but he forgot to ask me about that but so <laughs> at the premiere in la i got to hang out with graden a little bit and i was telling him the story and he goes, you got to call me because he goes, I only remember like five minutes from every session. I remembered every second of that session because I was amazed he, he, at the way he constructed that solo. And, you know, so he's a very cool guy. But, yeah, so I guess that's also what's pretty cool about being in that in the situation where you get to meet all these people that you admire. And um, so we had a lot of fun with that. But, yeah, Jay, Jay's an amazing player. 
Well, I wouldn't want to put you on the spot, and I wouldn't ever, uh, I would, you know, I wouldn't ask you who maybe disappointed you. But in terms of when you got around some of those people that were way better than advertised, like who would have been some of the people that you would have met back then that you said, "Thank you, God, they're nice people and cool people and and talented as well." Um, uh, um, I've been pretty lucky. I, uh, almost everybody I meet is is really cool. Like I did a, I did a thing with. Um, I was good friends with Les Paul and for some reason Les wanted me to produce a record for him which was going to be everybody that loved Les to sit in and make this record um, and so Les sends me over to CBS and and I said listen I don't want to do this by the time we get the clearances I said I love Les see you know I, I, and but who's going to play this record? You know, I mean, you know, they're, they're going to play it once, but there's nobody who's going to buy High to Moon nowadays and stuff. I said, I'll do it if we can get all these people that want to do it, if they contribute a song and less sits in with them. So anyway, they loved it and they gave us a budget and I hired Phil Ramon. This, uh, I was the executive producer and produced a couple of the tracks. And so long story short, I produced a track with Slash and Iggy Pop who wrote a song oh, and then wow. me and Lenny Kravitz did the backups. Wow. And so, and in those days it was Guns N' Roses days, and I wasn't a huge Guns N' Roses fan, and and all I knew was Slash by his image. Turned out he was a really great guy, intelligent, very cool. He would call the house to you know as we were talking about what we were going to do, and spend an hour on the phone with my son, who's going to be forty three next week. But in those <laughs> days he was a baby. And, uh, and you know, he, and my son was into BMX racing and Slash would talk about BMX racing with Jesse and invited him to a Guns N' Roses show and took him backstage and did all, yeah, I mean, he was like, he couldn't have been a better guy. And I said, wow, you know, it's like, you never prejudge people. Yeah. Mm. You know, um, Robert Plant, I got to hang out with him a little and he also with my son and he mm. was really, really um, a good guy. Um, so, you know, you get to me, so I, I'm trying to think if there's anybody that I, that I really didn't like that, um, and I really can't think of, you know, I mean, I like everybody unless they, they you know, they do something that, you know, you want to shoot them, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you but you know, I always thing. go into, you know, my, my wife, uh, is in the legal field and she's got great radar. And to me, I love everybody, you know, so it's like, and then she goes, no, nope. you know, you keep an eye out, keep an eye out, you know, and she's always right, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> but you would have seen so many people, Russell, like said, the bands that would have opened up for you early on had their own careers. Like you talk about Paul Simon being in the basement underneath you guys, you know, Paul Simon's a pretty big deal. It's like the people you would have met, the timing was perfect for you guys. It really was. Yeah. yeah. No, we met every, I mean, we met so many people and, um, like, uh, like I, I was friends with Chuck Lavelle from who plays with the stones and he was with the Allman brothers and stuff. And he invited me to a stones rehearsal. And my idol, one of my idols is Keith Richards. And so he, he goes, he comes back, we're backstage at wherever it was, like Nassau Coliseum or something. And he brings me this big like beer plastic cup, but it's filled with Jack Daniels and a little bit of Coke and some ice. He goes, this is for Keith. He goes, I'll make him another one. You, you have this one. So, okay. So I'm sitting there at the thing and so I'm sitting at the table, you know, and it's like um, where they have the hospitality stuff, but it's, you know, it's like where the crew eats and everything. So I'm sitting there and then boom, Charlie Watts comes and sits down next to me and then Jagger sits down. So everybody but Keith is at the table and I'm having, you know, dinner and I'm saying, oh God, you know, how cool is that? I love these guys. I never met them. I met Bill Wyman once, but that's it. And uh, and the only guy I didn't get to meet was Keith. <laughs> so for whatever but you reason, had his drink, so, I said, oh. so screw it. <laughs> Say what? So you had his drink anyhow, so screw it. I had his drink, yeah. No, but he, uh, to me, he's the coolest guy in the world. So uh, did you read his book? I read, I didn't get to all the way through it. I, 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 cause I, uh, it's I, awesome. I get, I get a ton of these, uh, you know, rock, event, or, uh, rock biographies or music biographies, and they're just fantastic. Because... D. Snyder did one from Twisted Sister, and he yeah. he he did I a whole think. piece. Well, he did a whole piece about uh, 
Billy Billy played in a band called Attila. That was like a metal band. <laughs> yeah, it was Which, like, oh god, yeah. Well, I had no idea, and I went looking to see if there's any pictures, or I, I couldn't find. Oh, there is. They had this there... album cover where there was like in a meat locker or something like that, and they were all dressed up like you know, like uh, gladiators or something. But it was like <laughs> there, was, there was a band, a two-piece band, and what the hell was the name of that band? Um, it was just two-piece piece power, like a big Hammond and a, and a drummer. And the name escapes me right right now, but that was kind of like the the influence for this band. But you know, <laughs> but yeah, nothing really happened with uh, with that. But and that was John Small um, with with uh, I think it was just John and uh, Billy. Well, and I mean, part of part of what I hear when I read some of those books, I mean, that scene in Long Island and all all around there just seemed yeah. to be really happening back then. Just a lot of talent that oh, came man. out of there. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's. I grew up in Plainview, but then my wife is from Seaford, who where Liberty was from, and then we wound up. Me and Lib moved to Massapequa, but. So around the corner from where we lived was Joey Buttafuoco. Around the corner from that was Jerry, where Jerry Seinfeld grew up. Right. Alec Baldwin grew up there. We used to see Brian Setzer in the early days walking around, you know, uh, you know, and Brian was his own there, great player. And, and and years later, I got to be good friends with Brian. A lot and, of comedians from that area too, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, Howard Stern, you know, Doug and I went to Jackie Martling's wedding <laughs> back in those days. Um, yeah. And then hip hop really got to start from that area too, really. Sure. Yeah. The, I mean, the, it, it was kind of a hotbed. There, you know, the, there was, uh, you know, like once again, just, just the times alone were, yeah. You know, there's so many talented people out there today so but we grew up in a song era we you know so there were songwriters there were the brill building there were studios there were engineers there were producers now everybody does their records on their laptops so it's kind of insular and it's like you don't have you know it, it it's not that there's not a lot of great stuff, but that whole mindset is different. And, and then you have the American idols and stuff and everybody singing scales around songs rather than respecting a great song mm. and arrangement of a song. So it's a whole different mentality. But I think about what we grew up with from the British invasion to right. the Motown and Stax and, and Muscle Shoals and all the great, right. great records. Right. And, and, and then the soul stuff and James Brown coming out. I mean, I, I would go to the Murray the K shows or the, um, uh, you know, or those compilation shows and you would see James Brown. And then you'd see the Rascals and the Buffalo Springfield. And the, it was mind boggling the amount of talent that that we grew up with and just the legacy of all those songs it was amazing and and i so i don't feel that today it's not like there's not great songs and great singers and great writers and stuff but it doesn't seem to me like the focus is on these amazing records and songs it's you know it, 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 what do you think it is russell what do you think it is? I think it's the nature of the fact that well, I can't even say that because people do combine talents and work with other people, but the industry in the fifties and the sixties was based around songs. There were songwriters, there was Carol King and Jerry Goffman would write these amazing songs, great interpretations. Motown was like a machine where the, you know, I, I it, it's so funny. My wife played me this thing that um, uh, Smokey Robinson on Darrell Hall's place. And, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and we must have played it a hundred times this past three days. And then it turns out I'm working on this project with Phil Ramone. And they said, yeah, well, uh, yeah, and we're watching Sarah Smile with Smokey Robinson and Daryl Hall and how great it was in T-Bone who played with Billy too, but T-Bone was just so great. And you know, he's a great bass player, but a great guitar player, a great guy. And um, and we just, wow, this is just so great. We, we, we were checking it out. And then for this project, um, and I'm going to tell you about this in a second, this Phil Ramone project that I'm working on. Mm. Uh, 
one of the guys that one of my friends who brought me into this, um, who was Phil, one of Phil's best friends, he says, yeah, well, I said, you know, who have you talked to and who have you brought in? And he goes, well, Sarah was, you know, with, you know, you know Sarah smiled, well, this is Sarah. And she lived with, you know, uh, Daryl for like 30 years or whatever. And, and we were just watching. I said, wow, is it a small world? How, you know, these things come together. But j just to give you uh, an idea of what I'm working on, I got, I got a call from, um, this dear friend of mine, a guy named Don Teague, who was one of Phil's best friends. He's an eye doctor. He was the eye doctor for the Yankees and for, you know, a million sports team and, and, and still has an amazing practice and for a lot of celebrities and stuff like that. But he, but he's just a really good guy. And I know him since, you know, way back when, you know, through Phil and, and Phil's wife, Karen also recently passed away and her brother, Phil, before he died, started this project with the Salvation Army called the Phil Ramon Orchestra for Children. And what they do is they subsidize all these kids that wouldn't have the opportunity to not only learn how to play on a regular basis or have instruments or whatever. So through the Salvation Army, they started this thing and raised a ton of money and they have a whole program together where these kids actually get to, uh, they have one-on-one -on -one instruction, they have groups, they do concerts, they do this. Okay, now with COVID, everything kind of changed. So now we have a group of people that are teaching um, virtually and whatever, and they broke away from the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army has their own problems and stuff. So this way, they, they they're restarting. There's a, a lady, um, Denise Richards from PBS and a bunch of musicians and, and, and people. And I'm part of the advisory board with this guy, Don. But so now we're going to um, release this video that we took and, tr and, and try to build this thing back up to keep it going. And once again, before Phil passed, this was one of his pet projects. And everybody that I know that ever met or worked with Phil loved him dearly. And so to me, it's a labor of love to just spread the word, to let everybody know that this is something that was dear to his heart, but to impart his spirit and to maybe feed it into some kids. And then hopefully once we get this thing back on its feet, we're going to expand it out and open up. Right now it's just in Harlem. There's a couple of locations in Harlem, uh, but then we're going to open it up to, uh, you know, to wherever we can get it, Miami and, and Nashville and, and wherever else. So I, what I will do is once they send me the final video, I'll send it to you. And if you could post yes, it, that please would be do. Great. Please 100%. do. Hundred percent. Be cool. Yeah. Honored to. And as you were talking there, Russell, something that um, uh, I'd love to get your opinion on because obviously the arts and, and and you know touring and all that because of all this stuff is is kind of in a bad way right now. Um, and up here in Canada, we've kind of had a little bit of a theory that sometimes they, they think music, oh, it's just fun. It doesn't need help. It's just fun. But it's always the yeah. thing that people go to. What, what, what's your kind of opinion on, on what's going on and, and where do you see it going? Because it's just right now it looks dire. But uh, I, I it, it, but it is dire that. because that's the first program that they cut in schools. Um, like I said, you know, I should talk because I, I wasn't a great, you know, musical student. I, I was okay in school. but. But, you know, the arts are things that help define generations. They're the things that people go back to when times are tough. They're the things that when you think back on a certain point in time, what is it that your mind goes back to? There's a song, there's something, there's a movie, there's something exactly that right. captures your heart that That's really right. reflects that time. I mean, so it's kind of critical to make sure that now in the times where I, you know, I, I don't understand where the arts is just kind of finding its way out of a curriculum. Um, it, so it's critical to support that, to encourage children to be the best that they can be. And if that's where they belong, that's great. The Phil Ramon program is giving kids a sense of belonging. It's, it's giving them real education. And there's some really talented kids in the program. Um, But it's more than that. This is, you know, it, it, it's kind of a way to, uh, when you promote a kid in that regard, 
you're helping his family. You're helping. You, you, you're opening up so many avenues to you're success. Hope, right? You're giving hope. Absolutely. So, um, so you know what I'm. You know, if people want to contribute, that's great. You know, I know times are tough right now, but to make awareness for it. So there are people that maybe have a couple of bucks that they could spend to help. We're, we're, we're talking to musical instrument companies to donate stuff. And they've been going on. This, this thing has been functioning and active for years, but now that they've broken away from the Salvation Army, we have to up the ante a little bit and make sure that it keeps going. Russell, and, do you know the website address at the top of your head? Uh, yeah, I'll send it to you and then, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, no, we'd, be, uh, we'd be honored to promote that for oh, sure. That would be wonderful. Thank you so yeah. much. Well, because uh, when in Hired Gun, Libwood Lib was talking about the, the programs that he does where he lives in, in New York. And I mean, yeah. you're right. Stuff like that is, um, you know, before he does we little came kids on. rock and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, and yeah. He's, he, he's been doing that for years, you know, and it means a lot to him. And, and you know, once again, and, and he's a great teacher, you know, and, and people see Lit, who's like this animal on stage, but he's probably one of the best studio drummers I ever saw. He idolized, he, he, he knows every aspect of the song. I don't even know if you, under, if you get that, but those parts he respects, you know, like a lot of drummers maybe say, oh, Ringo, you know, you know who cares? But Lib gets the idea that these are these yeah. songs and, and loves Ringo and, and really gets inside of these tracks and he's super, super creative. Um, sometimes you gotta look outside of the box sometimes. And when, when we'll be driving on gigs, we'll have like the Beatles channel on Sirius, where you know, we rent the car with the Sirius in it. And we're going through, and, and we go, and we're picking all these things apart all the time and stuff. So, I mean, every aspect of, of getting everybody back together is, you know, is kind of cool. Well, well, and when he, uh, Russell, it must be so awesome to, to have the band back together again. It must be just friggin' awesome. It's got to be. Oh, it's funny as hell, man. We, 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 we have a lot of fun and, you know, but, but now it's like, you know, it's like a nightmare. It's like, you know, I mean, the last real gig we had was in February of last year and we did like three parking lot gigs and now we have something, maybe we have gigs scheduled, but they keep, you know, you know, it, it, things start getting better and then they get worse. Now it looks like there'll be a vaccine and hopefully we'll be able to, you know, see the light at the end of the tunnel with this That's thing. Right. That's right. So, you know, all That's you can do is hang music. in and be positive and, and, you know, so who knows what's going to happen, but. Uh, yeah. I but, mean, it's, we were, we were out this weekend just kind of, in, in Dartmouth, we in Dartmouth is across the harbor from Halifax, but there was a real weird vibe around our city this weekend. And it, it I don't want to say people seem defeated, but they just seem like they just, oh, not again. And it was just a real strange feeling. And, and to your point, like, uh, hopefully this vaccine comes out soon. It gives people yeah. a little bit of hope to, yeah. to get moving. Well, it's going to, you know, uh, it's going to, you know, nothing lasts forever here. So, they, you know, and, and it's amazing. Sometimes it takes years and years to get a vaccine. So it's amazing. I mean, the, the part of this that's the most disconcerting to me is that this is a public health crisis. I don't know how it became political because it's not political. It's a public health crisis. And you know what? If wearing a mask means that you're going to save your life or somebody else's life, I don't understand why that's a problem for people yeah. because our numbers are just going through the roof. And I'm, I, I don't mean to get political about this, but you know, I, I wouldn't want to infect you. And I would hope you, you know, it's the same thing is that, you know, the, the, the people that think that this is against their, um, their freedom, you can't go into a restaurant and light up a cigarette, you know, yeah. I, mean, yep. I mean, take it in that same spirit. It is what it is. You know, let's just, let's help each other out. Let's, you know, uh, I don't understand how it got politicized. And, and, and I hope when this is over, everybody will take a deep breath and say, you know something, we're all in this together and let's stay in it together. No, and I mean, and, and, and for me, it, it, I guess one of the things, it, well, being political and stuff, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's the same way down in the States, but there's people, you know, losing jobs and losing money and whatever. Yeah. And the politicians are still getting paid. They're still getting their money. And meanwhile, you know, there's other people well, that are having a hard time making it, right? Well, hey, uh, like I said, I haven't worked since February. So, um, and, it, it, you know, it's just, 
you just want to, you know, you, we're all part of a community together. So, okay. you know, it's like, I just, I just want, I want everybody to stay healthy. My, my, my sister-in-law is a nurse in a big hospital in New York. And to hear the stories of what she's seen with this stuff. Mm -hmm. is she okay? Just, she's okay. But, um, but not everybody there was okay. And they had yeah. these refrigerator trucks, like, you know, stacked up with bodies and people don't realize some people think this is a that this is not real it's real you know it's my my cousin had it uh almost died um thank god he didn't but it was close and um you know it's real you know so let's yeah. just get through this together and yeah, yeah. and yeah, that's my speech. Well, and I mean, and the, the frontline workers like your sister-in-law, obviously, it, 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 you know, they're doing the work, but it, it, it takes a mental toll on them, too. That's right. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, right. without a doubt. Lib's uh, daughter is a nurse now. And, and not the one on TV that plays a nurse, but his other daughter is a real nurse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, actually, I told Lib a funny story when we talked to him. So uh, there's a kid that was up here that uh, was a hockey player that um, – got a concussion a number of times and ended up becoming an actor. And he, he's from here in Halifax and he was in two of those W network uh, movies. With you don't need brain stuff. function to be an actor. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm kidding. <laughs> Listen, Russell, That's we want joke. to be respectful of your time too. I want to ask you just a couple of quick questions. Cause uh, you know, sure. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bass player, but previous guitar player, I want to talk a little bit about gear. What are you using for gear right now? And I want to ask you, this is something I never asked anybody so far. What's the one guitar you wish you never sold or get rid of? Well, I pretty much have uh, all my guitars that, you know, um, like, like, here's a good story. I had, when I was a kid and the Beatles came out and I was such a Beatle freak uh, and, and the Beatles would play these J160Es, the electric acoustic Gibsons. And so right away, you know, got my parents to get me that guitar i still have it and it's got oh, a thin wow. neck yeah and it's all chewed up like crazy it's like it's a mess but i've had that you know my whole life and you know that was a guitar i would ride on and and look. so and it has a thin kind of neck and sometimes billy would write songs on the on the guitar and he asked me to borrow that guitar because it was easy to play so i lent him the guitar and then he moved or whatever and lost my guitar and it was my baby <laughs> So, <laughs> so I think he got me an ovation or something, a crappy ovation. But, um, but so years later, I forgot about the guitar and it was like, you know, you know, what are you going to do? But years later, I saw Springsteen playing in a video, a J160 that was chewed up and it looked kind of chewed up like mine. And my guitar roadie in those days was a guy named Chainsaw who later became Springsteen's roadie. And I call, I go, saw, you know, I just saw this video with Bruce playing this J160E and Billy borrowed that from me years ago. I mean, where did he get that guitar? And he goes, you know, he goes, I was with Bruce when he bought that guitar. And he said, that's not your guitar, but guess what? He goes, I know where your guitar is. It, it's in a closet in Billy's office. They couldn't remember where the guitar came from. So a million years later, I get a package. It's my guitar, my baby. Oh so, my god! Isn't that great? So, so, um, so I always had this one telly that I loved. That's on all the records. It's a dark, dark. It looks black with a tortoiseshell pickguard, but it's a dark, dark. You know, brown with a tortoiseshell, and that was the guitar on all the records. And what I did was I out of phase in between the two pickups. And that's the sound of gunk, 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 and all that. And we got ding, 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 all, all the, that, that um, kind of, it, it, it sounds like, if, you know, on a Strat, that two and four position where it's got a little glassy sound to it. Mm. So this is a similar sound, but it's all telly. And, and I still have that guitar, but I had it refinished and somebody nicked the pickup. And I, so I stopped using it on stage because or in the studio because it just it, it was my baby and it had it just felt and sounded great and it just never sounded the same it sounds okay but it's not that and it frustrates me too much so then i started looking for other guitars and i got a guitar from reverend if you ever heard of them 
and 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 this one guitar was really good. So it it had these weird pickups in it called um, I forgot what they're called, but but um, it's kind of like a humbucker, but and they and they can split it so you can get a single coil and and a and a, and a ballsy sound rail hammers they're called and. Uh, oh but, yeah, yeah, energy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I was using that pretty much exclusively for the Lords, but I kept working. I have an old Les Paul special that I put originally put um, uh, mini humbuckers in, but now I just took those out. And Lindy, Lindy Fralin has these um, P90s. It originally came with P90s, but they're noiseless. So I just put them in. Those sound great. And Les Paul signed the front of it you know you chewed up the whole front of my guitar so that's a cool guitar <laughs> but lately i've been i bought a couple of gretches okay. and which i never ever played i never had a gretch before in my life for all these years never even played a gretch i hate to tell you and i got a couple of gretches and i was like i say i, I was friends with setzer so i got a setzer model one um not from brian but <laughs> i actually bought it <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's pretty cool. And then I got this other hollow body one that was like the like the guy from um, Chris Gall uh, Cliff Gallup from the uh, um, Gene Vincent band. So I got like a, a a solid body chambered one like that, which is pretty cool. And uh, so I'm trying to think of if there's any guitars I got rid of that I'm sorry I got rid of, and I really can't. I mean, I can't think of it. I that mean, I love all my I love all my guitars but I don't believe in keeping them around if you don't play them. So yep. even though I had stuff that I loved, if I wasn't using them, somebody should be loving them and, and playing them. Cool. So I had a, um, uh, ever hear of B&G guitars? Mm -hmm. It was a, uh, yeah, so I got a B&G guitar that, uh, that was beautiful and it was gorgeous and it was just beautiful and it's not a cutaway. So it's like kind of like an old blues guitar. Nice. But I couldn't get, but the stuff that I play, I couldn't get upstairs because, the, you know, it was like a short neck. And so I couldn't do the parts. So I, you know, so I was sitting in the case. And I said, what a shame. So, so I got rid of that one. It's hard to see it go, but I don't have enough room to put all this crap, you know, together. I had a J135 that I got rid of when I got um, the Setzer guitar, the, the Gretsch. Yep. Um, but so I, don't, I don't have all that many guitars, but I guess I have a bunch. Um, I have a guitar that um, th there's a song that we did called "Keeping the Faith." If you know that one, mm -hmm. and the beginning of that boom, ba -doo -ba -doo -ba -doo -ba -doo -doo -doo, that's on an acoustic guitar. It's an Ovation Adamus, and I got it off really? the line. I went to Ovation, and, and I got to pick one off the line, and that's just plugged in electric, but it has this nice, nice round, fat sound to it. So that's not even like, that, that's an acoustic guitar, but that has a very cool sound on that record. So I have that one. And Paul Simon had borrowed that guitar because he liked the way it sounded for, I don't know if he ever played it on the album, but he borrowed it when he did the Graceland album. So I still have that one. I've got that original. I have Gibson made me a couple of J180s, the Everly Brothers style, but they custom okay, yeah. made them. And those I used to use all the time. Like, and, but my favorite guitars, acoustic now, is Gibson had made this thing. It was like kind of, remember the Chet Atkins SST? They were like solid body acoustics. Yep. And they yep. didn't feedback. They made maybe about 100 of them. It's called uh, Americanas, Americana Ranger. And I've got three of them. You know, because I said they sound great. They sound better than the SSTs, and they're very cool. But you can play a lot of lead on that too. Like the lead stuff sounds really good. No, I, I, I no, it's really an acoustic guitar, but it's easy to play. Yeah. And you know, so but it's but you don't have to worry about it. it sounds great in the house. It just goes direct, no feedback, and and Lib plays loud as hell. So you know, you can compete with Lib. You know, <laughs> with that without feeding back. So I, those are my, that's my acoustic on stage with the Lords. Didn't use so, that with Billy, but now, yeah. And, I, and yeah. I'm betting that, uh, I'm betting Paul Simon gave your guitar back and you never lent Billy Joel another guitar again after that. Is that, <laughs> yeah. a, is that a fair statement? I, I think that's, yeah, you know, you know what? <laughs> if, if he called me and asked me, I'd give it to him. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, it, 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 after all the years, because I'm in hired gun and obviously, you know, Liv had a great piece about what happened there. And it, it's good to, good to hear that, you know, fences were mended or whatever. Yeah. And, yeah, no, it's all cool. 
Awesome. Because you guys are a band. You guys were friends. I mean, you can't take that away. I mean, you watch the old videos, yo, and it's like, oh, man, it's like broke my heart when I heard the story. I just, I, I know it never even knew, right? But I'm glad everything's okay now. You know, it's, we're all too old. We've been around the block too many times. As it is for me, I just, it's too much work to work up hate for somebody or anima I, you know, I just you know i can't go there you know just yeah. you know there, maybe there's people in my life that i'll avoid you know or, or or not want to put that effort into it but i can't you know i i have a hard time hating anybody so, really? so. well uh, we're like we said we're going to be respectful of your time here russell but that just before i i ask the last question i i, I do want <laughs> you to send us that link yeah, yeah we will definitely post that. But it's going to take uh, a day or two because I'm waiting for nope. the video to come. But I'll see, no but I promise you I will Perfectly send it. all right. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm going to send Andy an email, but please thank Andy for setting this up because you uh, guys cool. have been lights out every time. Um, we were telling people that we were, uh, were going to have you on the show. And one person asked me, asked Russell if there's one tune that he played on that would sort of define, you know, mm. go listen to this tune. What would it be? Well, I I don't know. Uh, the one that comes to mind was Billy's first number one record was um, still rock and roll to me. You'd think it would have been just the way you are. It would have been, but I'm a reggae fan from day one. My wife and I got to even hang out with Marley a little bit. Oh, cool. um, yeah, it was very cool. And uh, so I always, you know, if you listen on the bottom of a lot of those records, I'm doing a lot of that reggae guitar playing over a rock, you know, all that staccato stuff that is very simple sounding, but all the guitars on Still Rock and Roll to me is a reggae guitar with a rock and roll beat. Mm. And it just clicks a gung, 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 ching, 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 ching. It's all reggae with a rock and roll beat. And boom, that just exploded. That was his first number one. So to me, like I said, I never thought of myself as a guitar player, but that's one where that instinct really paid off. Um, another one's like, you know, every guitar player that plays a Billy song plays You May Be Right. Mm -hmm. So that's really the first thing, you go, dang, dang, dang. That's the first thing that came into my head while, you know, it, it, it was that fast, you know? So it was like, you know, so maybe those two stick out a little bit. Well, thank you very much. And you know what? Uh, I, I really enjoyed this. You are a true gentleman, my friend. It was nice to meet yeah. you guys are just, you're so chill. Uh, every time that we, you know, we talk to Lib, we talk to you. It's just, uh, you see the class, you see the fact that you guys are still loving life and still doing it. And uh, yeah, cool. Dave thank and you. I, this is, this is absolutely fantastic. And uh, we yeah. really appreciate it. Appreciate it back. Russell, and, this has uh, been an absolute treat, brother. This has been such a treat to meet you and talk to you. Yeah, cool. like, maybe we have a part you on there, but you know, if you have more time there on the road, you think? Uh, hey, where the hell am I going? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> and, uh, I, I, I will say I, I work in sales during the day, and I will follow up on that link. So don't worry. Don't worry about, yeah. What Thanks part so of much, Florida Russell. again? Say so what? What part of Florida? Boca. So it's South Florida. Yep. So to so wear your mask down there. Take care of our friend Russell. Let me tell you something. It's the mask and the uh, the uh, sanitizers. It's like, you know, oh, my own. It's like a hazmat suit when I go out. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, brother. Well, and I think, I think we're going to have to figure out the way to get Russell one of these snappy mugs, oh, too. Oh, jeez. I sent go. two of them to Andy already. Yeah. Yeah. Right, $1,000 in shipping. Thanks so much. <laughs> Appreciate Cheers. it, guys. All right. Okay. You take care, Bye. Russell. Pleasure meeting you, brother. You too. All right. Be good. Bye. All the best.